Okay. <laughs> Here we are live. Thank you. Due to the COVID-19 emergency declaration, this special meeting of the General Government Committee is being held electronically and live streamed on the town's website. All members of council in attendance are participating by audio and video teleconference and town staff are available throughout the meeting if council members have any questions on the agenda. For members of the public watching from home, please bear with us if we encounter any technical difficulties throughout the meeting. Good morning, everyone. I am now calling this meeting to order. Are there any disclosures of pecuniary interest? Seeing that there is none, we will move directly into presentations. We have a presentation on the May 2021 Ajax, Ajax fire. fire. Sorry? Sorry? Why? Why? I had an echo there. Okay, so yeah, we have a presentation on the May 2021 Ajax Fire and Emergency Services Master Plan, the Fire Master Plan, the FMP, and the May 2021 Community Risk Assessment, the CRA. This is prepared by Deputy Fire Chief Burridge. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, um, I'm going to start off by passing the signal to the Fire Chief. Fire Chief, Chief Dave Lang. Hi, everyone. Just mute if you're not on. on the call. The call. Just, just going to do that. Do that. Hello. Can you hear me? You're clear, uh, Chief. Um, Thank you. I think Deputy Fire Chief was there was an echo when he was uh, speaking. Can, can you try again, Aaron? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I believe the Fire Chief has some remarks that he wants to make to open up the meeting. Please proceed, Chief. Thank you. Thank you uh, for allowing us to be here before Council, the Mayor and Council today. Um, just want to introduce uh, Daryl Cully from Emergency Management and Training. He is the consultant group that has uh, put together our fire master plan and also uh, our community risk assessment, which is uh, being presented to you today. He has a, uh, as you can see on the screen, I believe it's up there, um, a presentation for council, given an overview, we'll definitely answer questions. Um, with them, uh, joining again will be uh, Deputy Chief Aaron Burge. He's been working with uh, emergency management and training to put together this uh, fire safety plan update <clears throat> over the last few years uh, to now bring to council. So at that point, I will turn it over to Daryl for the uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, good um, morning, uh, Chair and Council and Chief and Deputy. Um, thank you for this opportunity for the presentation. Uh, just to let you know, um, you know, this is a project that started uh, about uh, 19 months ago. Um, it slowed down a little bit for, uh, for COVID, um, but it is a very in-depth uh, project. The actual report ended up being um, uh, well over 200 pages. Um, we do have 79 slides, so I'm going to talk quickly and go through them quickly. Um, but please uh, feel free to interrupt me or ask questions as you see appropriate. And I thank the person who will be assisting me for moving the slides as I have lots of notes. So a master fire plan provides a framework um, to guide the future of the fire department. Um, the Ontario Fire Marshal recommends that every fire department has a master fire plan or, or sort of like a strategic plan and it guides the, guides the future. The council, with um, the advice of the, uh, the fire service, um, ultimately makes the decision on the level of response to the types of emergencies. Keeping in mind, the fire department does not just respond to fires, but to all types of calls, motor vehicle accidents, um, hazardous materials, chemical spills, rescues, um, carbon monoxide, and on and on we go. So the, the fire department is a, um, a very busy organization and hence the name Fire and Emergency Services now. Next slide, please. So the um, last uh, fire master plan was done in 2012 and it was received uh, for information by council. The chief at the time was to bring back any recommendations um, to council based on that fire master plan. 
there was some challenges um, in, in the during that time frame. And so most of the uh, recommendations never made it to council or senior management team or council. So um, basically this will be the, the, the first master fire plan where the, the chief will be moving forward with the recommendations in quite some time. Next slide, please. So what a master fire plan looks at is where are we now? You know, where's the fire service now? Where's the community now? And how do we best serve that community? And how do we get there? And we get there through a couple different documents. The first one is the community risk assessment, which we'll talk about, then the fire master plan, and then ongoing reports to council on the, the status of achievement. So we recommend that the chief comes forward annually to say, you know, here's the recommendations, here's the ones we're working on, here's the ones that have been approved, and, and here's where we're at on an annual basis. Next slide, please. So the community risk assessment um, uh, takes a look at the, the risks in the community and it, it um, is required now by the Ontario Fire Marshal's Office to be uh, reviewed annually and updated every five years. This is a new piece of legislation. It's just come into place. Um, so this will be the first community risk assessment that you've had done. In the past, they were called simplified risk assessments. They were a very much smaller document. Um, this is very complex and it's often considered confidential because it contains a lot of critical infrastructure in the community, which, you know, for varying reasons, you don't necessarily want out to the, the community. Next slide, please. So again, the community risk assessment is a, um, is a new provincial requirement. It identifies the risks in the community, but it also takes a look at what the, the mitigation and prevention opportunities are and how the fire department can contribute to that. There is a, a requirement in the legislation that the fire chief does give the, uh, the council an annual update as to the uh, community risk assessment and where it goes. Next slide, please. So that's a very labor intensive document. Um, as you can imagine, or you live in Ajax, you're, you're guiding Ajax, you know over the past 15 to 20 years how much growth Ajax has seen. Um, you know, as part of the, the GTA, increased residential and commercial development, um, uh, major highways and railways going through the community, um, care facilities, you, you understand that there's, there's a significant number of different items that that um, can be considered risk. Next slide, please. So why does risk assessments matter? Because what it allows us to do is, is try to match the service that you're providing to the level of risk. It also gives us opportunity to identify and mitigate a lot of those risks by doing things like uh, fire safety education, um, code inspections and enforcement. And then of course, the emergency response. So when we look at the fire and emergency services, it's not just response-based. It's all about educating the community to reduce the risks that they find on a day-to-day -day basis um, and, and move forward through that. Next slide, please. So this is just a, a, a slide, um, the, the slide and the next one, if go ahead to the next slide. And um, these, these slides just identify some of the standards that we used when we developed the fire master plan. So, you know, the, the fire master plan comes from, from standards, best practices, common practices, um, I, legislation, as well as, as things uh, very key here, you'll see is the section 21 guidelines which are the health and safety guidelines <clears throat> for the fire service in Ontario. Next slide, please. So what happens is the, the Ontario Fire Marshal has set out what they call the three lines of defense. So the first line of defense to an emergency is that public education component. Let's, let's educate the public in reducing their risks to the, the, the um, that they face, the ones that they have ability to, 
to deal with. The second component is the code enforcement through inspections. So we want to educate the public. We, we have series of codes, whether they're fire codes, building codes, uh, bylaws, etc. cetera. Um, uh, we want to do inspections and enforce that and, and even use that as part of the education process to the community to reduce the risks in the community. And the third and final line of defense, if all else fails, is the emergency response. Next slide, please. So it, it's very important to note that, um, you know, there's a lot of focus within the document, not just on the fire department's response or fire and emergency services response, but also from a holistic perspective, from a community safety perspective, which is where the fire marshal's office is, is really wanting to take communities in Ontario. So some of the challenges that we found, um, the communities had 20 years of dramatic growth and, and you've got continued intensification and planning. Um, but the fire department has not kept pace. You know, we see 29% in call volume increase, 29%, 39% growth in the population. Um, and yet there has not been any um, growth within the fire service on the suppression side since 2016. So we're talking, you know, some significant growth where, let's face it, that the community has fallen behind. All right, next slide, please. On top of that, we see some significant changes in provincial requirements for the community um, and for the fire service, pressures on the leadership. Uh, things like adding the community risk assessment, um, adding training standards, adding reporting, um, additional reporting requirements, um, the, the fire marshal's office has been continually trying to move the for province forward, but by doing that, they're adding additional work on to the, the leadership of the community. And you've got a fire service, um, which only has three non-unionized leaders within the, within the community. Um, so the, the workload that they've seen has been fairly significant. In addition, the growth has put pressure on fire prevention. You know, they're, they're out there, they've got a 39% increase in, in population and all this new development, and they, they need to be involved on a, a proactive, not a reactive basis. Um, call demand puts pressure on both the dispatch center and the fire suppression response. And of course, the occupational health and safety um, standards a certification and a, a move to um, a national standard so that um, the, the fire marshal's office is adopting the NFPA standards as opposed to trying to create their own and that's putting additional uh, pressure on your training division. Next. All right, so what we did was we took a look at uh, where you're at and try to forecast you know, over the, the next um, seven to 10 years, where are you going to be at? And so we've created a, a series of, of recommendations and implementation strategies uh, for council. Keep in mind, uh, so I don't want to, I don't want to shock you, but keep in mind, we're, we're playing a game of catch up here in Ajax um, because they're, it's really fallen behind. So uh, let's move to the, the first recommendation. We're gonna talk more about the, the strategic recommendations, those recommendations where, where council is actively involved. There are quite a few recommendations that are what we would call operational recommendations. Those are the, the recommendations the fire chief can just action because they're, you know, they might be talking about a specific um, um, operating guideline or um, a specific way of doing things that the, the chief can address um, within the department. Uh, so the first thing is the um, establishing and regulating bylaw for the community it was last updated in 2006. We recommend that they be reviewed annually and then updated as required. Um, 
so they don't have to be um, updated uh, annually, but just reviewed annually. This one uh, is it. It's required. It's time. It needs to be um, updated, taking a look at response levels, reflect new legislation, um, uh, changes in the, the Fire Prevention and Protection Act. Um, and so uh, in the short term, we're recommending that the chief take a look at the, the bylaw, review it with the, uh, the town solicitors and come forward to uh, council um, with a, an updated uh, bylaw. So this the timeline when we talk about short term, short term recommendations are one to three years. Midterm are going to be four to six years and long term are going to be seven to 10 years. All right. So within the, the next uh, year or so, um, we're, we're suggesting the chief come forward with an updated bylaw. OK, next slide, please. Uh, Fire department diversity. Um, the diversity of the community has, has grown significantly. Um, and yet the, the workforce within the, the fire and emergency services does not reflect the community. Um, so we're, we're recommending that the, uh, the chief and deputy chiefs work closely with the town's diversity coordinator um, and explore opportunities to create a more, more diverse um, workplace that's more reflective of the, uh, the community that it serves. And that's again in the short term. Next slide, please. One of the, um, the standards that we look at is uh, Commission on Fire Accreditation International, uh, CFIA. Um, and and they, they put out basically the best practices Many fire departments work towards accreditation. What we're suggesting at this time is that the, uh, the chief or deputy chiefs have an opportunity to attend uh, one of their workshops so they can start to look at how best practices are, um, how they're esta uh, established and how they may have opportunity to work towards that. So that's, that's basically just a, uh, a workshop that they should we're recommending they attend. Next slide, please. FUS guidelines. So FUS is the um, the fire underwriters survey. This is this is the insurance company body um, that gets together and they establish uh, insurance rates and they do make recommendations on, on some areas of the fire service. And one area of the fire service that they make recommendations on is how frequently buildings are inspected. So, you know, whether it's a, an occupancy, so um, uh, whether it's a, for example, an apartment building, a group home, um, vulnerable occupancies would be group homes, retirement homes, um, hospitals, um, they make recommendations on restaurants and industry and, and all different types of, of um, inspection frequencies. Right now, the, uh, the fire service is, um, um, they're doing what they can with the uh, inspection team that they have. But what we recommend is that they, they look at the guidelines, the frequencies, pick um, those areas that are the, the highest priorities have got the greatest risk, and then uh, focus on those and try to get the, the number of inspections, grow the number of inspections. Of course, that's going to take staff time and resources. Next slide, please. All right, so the recommendation here is that from the community risk assessment that the, the fire service throughout the risk assessment, there's identified in there um, opportunities for prevention and mitigation strategies. The fire service take a look at those and um, uh, implement those, uh, put a, a plan in place where they can start to, uh, to reduce some of those risks. Next slide, please. The, the leadership of the community um, uh, of the fire service, you've got 114 staff and three managers, three non-unionized managers. They have a lot of pressure on them. Um, 
and that has only grown over the past number of years with the, the increases in legislation, health and safety requirements, reporting requirements, etc. cetera. Um, it, it's, um, it's put them so that they're, they're really struggling in their, the workload that they, they currently have. So our recommendation is to provide them some additional support to the chief and deputies um, and that the fire chief make a, a recommendation or recommendations to the operating and capital budget process in order to provide some additional support to the, the, uh, the management team. Next slide, please. Um, so ad administrative support, um, particularly with fire prevention. Fire prevention does not have a, a dedicated administrative assistant. They do get support through, um, you know, a, a shared. Um, but what you find happening is fire prevention officers are doing tasks that an administrative assistant could be doing. Um, that really should be assigned to things such as inspections and education and that sort of thing. Um, you know, they're, so they're, they're doing tasks that um, could be delegated if those resources were, were possible. So um, there's a part-time administrative position, uh, simply um, uh, moving it to full-time and uh, realigning uh, the roles because right now the administrative assistants are, are sharing based on what who comes to their, their desk. Um, so assign specific roles to specific staff. Excuse me, point of order chair. We're on slide 21 of 81 and we're 24 minutes into the meeting. I think we've all read this. It was all in the material and I don't wanna spend an hour and 20 minutes listening to a PowerPoint when I think we wanna ask questions. If it's okay with my colleagues, I would um, suggest we, we move ahead and, and so we can discuss the actual plan. I, I, I don't need to hear every single position respectfully, Mr. Kelly. Okay, yes, sir. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, where would you um, like us to go? I'm at, I'm at the uh, discretion of the chair. I just would like to know what my colleagues think. I've read this fairly thoroughly. Um, I do have some questions and um, I, I just would like to sort of poll the group and see if we want to move on and get to our questions and discuss. Yeah, I plan. agree with you, Mr. Mayor. We can go directly to the questions. We are all a bit okay with the report. Um, we've got some time to go through it and we do have quite a bit of questions. So. If you would all agree, I'd like to go to questions. So I'm just asking, um, does Mr. I mean, this is a publicly available presentation. It could be that this is not necessarily for our benefit who's read this, but for the public. So Mr. Colley, uh, do you think, assuming we've all read this, which we have, but do you still feel the need to go about the presentation in spite of that? Is this something that Ajax Fire wants the public to review slide by slide? Because if so, I understand that. But if not, then I agree with the chair, we could go into questions. Well, through you, Mr. Chair, um, the slides are pretty straightforward. Um, as you're aware, if someone went and read through them, I don't think um, they would have any challenge in understanding what the slides are saying. And we will ask those questions as well, so we can clarify anything, right? So. Um, I will proceed with questions. Uh, Regional Councillor Dice, I see your hand. Yes, thank you. And, and I share um, Regional Council Lee's concerns. It is a public meeting and I think um, it, this is a huge, huge undertaking. And there's a lot of different moving parts to it. And I think the public uh, you know, would prefer to have a presentation to better understand it. We, We've been through this in some cases. It's it's a little bit different for us, but I think for the public, it's really important in order to support this moving forward. So would you prefer to go through the presentation? Yes, I would. Okay. Just point of order, Chair. I just have had a look at the participants and there are no public on. It's all staff and council. There is no public um, on this meeting. I, I just meant so much like these 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 things are recorded for YouTube at the end of the day. Correct. And yeah. people may review it after the fact. It's not 
unheard of. I'm not, listen, I, I'm, I, whether you counsel, I'm at the will of counsel, but at the same time though, I also think if Ajax Fire, for example, wants this information in a public forum and reviewed, then it's just like, this is, we called this special meeting to review this and I'm okay with that too. Okay, um, Councillor Tyler Moore. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I concur with the mayor and uh, the reason why I concur with the mayor is because this is publicly available. Um, it's a public document. Everyone can see it. They, we're all here. They can read it. They can take their time. And I don't know if we need to have an audio book version of it as well, but it's all there, ready to go. And well, uh, how can we how can we meet in the middle? Um, Daryl, can you summarize it maybe and uh, and go through it? Um, wow. Well, well, Mr. Chair, uh, as, as you can imagine. Um, you know, a, a summary would be um, uh, quite quickly, um, the fire service has had its challenges keeping up to the demands and uh, there's additional resources required. Um, um, spread over, you know, a, a 10 year, a 10 year process. I mean, you can give it a little bit more than just a two liner summary. It's <laughs> right, so just to meet in the middle. Um, all right, well, uh, let me just scan these very quickly. Yeah, we can uh, go through them a little bit quicker and just summarize each slide. So I think that would be meeting in the middle, fair enough, fair enough. For the high points, Chair. The high yeah. points, that's what we're looking for, the high points. Okay, um, all right, well, um, what I can do is, is just skip through the slides. Um, and uh, speak to the ones that um, that have significant impact. Much appreciated, sir. Okay, so if we could go to the next slide, please. Okay, I'm um, just talking about training challenges coming up. Um, next slide, please. Uh, talking about certification of firefighters and uh, the challenges that's placed on training. Next slide, please. Uh, again. Um, the, the training division um, has fallen behind its ability to to provide the the training that's kept or that the province is moving towards with the new standards. Uh, next slide, please. Um, platoon training coordinators, pretty straightforward, using someone from the floor to assist each platoon. Uh, next slide. Um, this is a long-term, um, you know, ten, seven years from now, we're, we're anticipating there's gonna be more demand for training, so additional resources. Uh, next slide, please. Um, marketing your training tower to other organizations um, when it's not being used by Ajax in order to generate some, some additional revenue. It's being done to a point at the moment. Next slide, please. Uh, well, already touched on this, um, increasing the uh, number of, of inspectors to assist with the um, um, number of uh, inspections. So, so doing a comparison to the, the workload to the resources. Next slide, please. Again, uh, keeping, keeping up as the community grows. Next slide. Um, this is talking about uh, training captains so that they're uh, providing them some additional training so that they're familiar with um, um, inspections and education when they're out dealing with the community. Next slide, please. Uh, space is an issue. So this is just talking about um, a, an interim solution as to where we could move uh, fire inspection staffing in the short term. Uh, next slide. Um, the computer-aided dispatch system, it has not been updated in many years. Um, the new systems are um, much more advanced. So the computer-aided dispatch system really needs to be, to be brought up to speed. Okay, next. So, all right, um, and a lot of that has as you grow, in order to make decisions in the future, you need the data. 
and the computer system you have currently is not very good at providing you the data that you need in order to make those decisions. Next, next slide, please. Um, and it's just showing you how the community has, has grown and that the, or the call volume has grown um, between the two uh, fire services that you dispatch. So um, you, you need a system that's gonna be able to keep up with that. Um, and the recommendation to replace that CAD was also made in 2012. So it's, you know, an old computer system is an old computer system. Next slide, please. Uh, so Mr. Chair, am I moving along at a reasonable rate? Okay, thank you. You're doing fine. Uh, Thanks. All right. Um, so right now there's one supervisor in the, uh, the communication center um, and we're, we're recommending um, as growth comes along, new technologies, et cetera, that they receive um, um, additional supervisory support. Right now there's no proactive quality assurance. Um, there's minimal training to, for the communicators. Uh, so they're having challenges. So providing some additional communication support supervisory support. Next slide, please. And uh, so that's just for the chief to bring it to the, to the budget process. Next. Um, staffing. Um, so next generation 911 is coming up. Um, you've probably heard a lot about that. We do not know the actual implications to staffing um, for communications until we see what it actually looks like. So we're suggesting that once next generation 911 comes in, um, that a review of communication staffing occurs at that point. Okay, next slide, please. All right, let's follow through. Next slide. Suppression staffing. Um, you're re responding to a whole lot more fires, um, a whole lot more demand, and all types of different types of emergencies now. Um, you know, 2006 carbon monoxide detectors are not very common. And now they're responding to a significant number of carbon monoxide calls, that sort of thing. Um, substantial building stock. Uh, next slide, please. So we're recommending, um, well, right now you've got a minimum staffing of 16 personnel, um, which is just under the uh, NFPA recommended for a fire, uh, a house fire of 17. Um, and there's some additional requirements for larger fires, which you call mutual aid for. Next slide. Um, just some, some comparisons of the, the number of firefighters per thousand in the community. Um, you'll see Ajax currently has uh, 0 0.66 firefighters um, per thousand. Um, if you look at the, the rest of the um, Durham region and, and then of course um, other communities of similar size um, per thousand, you know, this is where Ajax has fallen behind. Mr. And, Chair, and Mr. Chair, if I can, uh, this is Shane Baker, the CAO, just if I could just interject here. This, this slide you. here uh, is really probably the most important slide uh, in the presentation and, and to, to show council how um, we've fallen behind as far as uh, keeping up with growth and resources and so on. If you look at, it, 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 it's been a general um, rule for years and years that uh, um, to keep up with growth, <clears throat> you should have one fire suppression staff or one firefighter per thousand population. So if you look at the Lakeshore municipalities there, they're pretty close to one firefighter per thousand, um, whereas we are at 0.66. And then if you look at all the other comparators as well, like we're way behind everyone else. So the really the intent of this presentation today was to show council that um, the fire service in Ajax has not kept up with growth and, uh, and that's why there's such a big ask in front of you today. And I think that, that's what we needed to do today is really artic articulate to you um, where we are in our current situation um, and why these recommendations are coming forward to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Please proceed. Uh, thank you. Uh, so next slide, please. 
<clears throat> so um, one of our recommendations is that 20 firefighters be added, um, career firefighters be added to the, the fire service. In doing so, it, it brings you up to 0 0.82. So it, it doesn't, as the, um, the CAO had mentioned, you know, typically the guideline is to try to keep one per, per um, thousand. Um, even adding 20 firefighters it still leaves Ajax in that bottom tier of, of how many firefighters per thousand in the, uh, in the community, but it does, so trying to be fiscally responsible instead of saying, we want you to jump 40 firefighters to bring you right up to the top. Um, we're, we're recommending at this point, 20 firefighters, um, which is going to bring you more in line and more capable to, to meet the demands. Um, next slide, please. Um, it's uh, just, just filling in where the, the data comes from. Next slide. So the, the recommendation is to add five firefighters to, uh, per platoon. Um, so you've got a, an existing piece of apparatus that is unstaffed at the moment. So you do not need to buy another fire truck. They would be bringing these firefighters on and assigning them to a truck in a station that you already have um, uh, the resources sitting there for. Um, and this will allow the, the fire service to, to more effectively deal with uh, most of the calls that you receive and that you would need to deal with, you know, for primarily the, the single family dwelling. Um, um, and then for those larger incidents, that's when you use mutual aid and assistance from your, your community or call in additional fire staff. So we're recommending that in the short term. That is a very high priority um, uh, to, to, uh, to give your fire department the ability to, to serve the community in the way it needs to be. Next slide, please. Um, so this is, this is just talking about uh, what we talked about even with the additional 20, um, uh, firefighters, um, and if, if as the community continues to grow, if there's not any additional staffing, uh, those challenges are just going to com um, compound themselves. Next staff, slide, please. All right. Um, so in order to, to further address that, um, you know, there's a, a recommendation to bring another eight firefighters on. Um, you know, so bring 20 on immediately, staff that additional truck, um, get it moving forward and bring um, an additional eight firefighters on to, to deal with some of the other uh, challenges that you're facing. Um, that, by doing that, it would bring you up to, um, you know, 0 0.88. Um, so it's gonna be more in line with, with what is generally accepted out there. Um, and what other communities are doing. Next slide, please. Right. Um, so this, this is uh, two firefighters per platoon and um, it, it, so it's gonna be spread out. It's gonna help you address a, a number of challenges that the, uh, the fire service is currently, um, currently seeing. Next slide, please. All right, so um, the, from here, what we're saying, um, this recommendation is basically saying, keep up. <laughs> in the future, have the fire chief come back on a regular basis and say, here's how we're doing, here's the number of calls, here's the resources. Um, so we're not putting any additional recommendations for staffing in the midterm, but for the, the fire chief to, to keep, council aware of where you're at and um, bring any additional requests forward. Next slide, please. Traffic concerns, um, congestion, town's growing. 
Uh, next slide. Um, doing a, a um, fire station location study. Next slide, please. It, um, and why time matters. So it, this is just talking about the, the criticality of, uh, of good response time. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry. Could you go back one slide, please? Just yes. for a second. Thank you so much. So, so this slide um, shows you the, the four minute travel time from each station. Um, so where the fire apparatus can get to within four minutes of leaving the station. It's based on road networks, um, things like the number of intersections they have to travel through, stop signs, stop lights. Um, it's based on the, the speed limits as well. So it's Thank based you. on the, the posted speed limit. Um, we do know fire, fire apparatus are allowed to exceed that if safe to do so. Um, and it'll depend on traffic conditions and, and weather and, and that sort of thing. So um, this just demonstrates, for example, the, the traffic congestion, for example, that, that station one sees in comparison to the other stations. Okay. Next slide. Okay. Criticality of, of, of fire um, and how quickly, you know, fire uh, um, grows until there's a the point of, um, um, you know, flashover. And next slide, please. Um, you know, we took a little bit of looking at um, where there's some gaps in, in response capabilities based on the, the travel times. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the drive time rings, it's a software we use called Caliper Maptitude. It's a GIS software um, and just telling you what it takes into consideration, but it does not take into consideration things like speed bumps, raised crossings, um, your um, ability to, or your traffic calming um, types of, of um, programs. Next slide, please. Uh, so in the midterm, because we do know that you're going undergoing a uh, some significant changes in your road networks, and uh, you 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 have a, a major traffic uh, program and study on the go. So we're saying once once that's completed, then take another look at where your stations are and uh, what opportunities um, there are to to better serve the community. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is a, a community initiative. Um, you have, for example, at, at headquarters, if, if someone's in distress, they can come within the, the come to the station and pick up a phone and, and call for assistance. And next slide, please. More on that. Uh, next slide. Uh, fleet replacement. Um, so we're Go with next slide, please. So the um, uh, standards, both FUS and NFPA recommend uh, 15 years maximum for first line apparatus um, and 20 years for reserve. Um, we're, uh, that has been kept in, up in most cases, but we're recommending that um, that be very closely followed as far as the, the fleet replacement schedule keep your fleet reliable. Next slide, please. All right. Um, maintaining the vehicles is a, is a challenge. Um, fleet operations has 300 vehicles. The fire department, you know, they often uh, want to be first in line. Um, they need to be first in line because of the lack of vehicles, that sort of thing, and they need to be, have them on the road. Um, uh, an emergency vehicle technician, that's a mechanic who's specially trained in understanding pumps and the electrical wiring and that sort of thing um, would be an asset for the community. Next slide. Right. Um, and just talking about how that would assist in, um, in keeping your vehicles on, on the road and keeping them uh, well-maintained. Next slide, please. 
Um, this talks about, uh, uh, so the fire department currently does not oversee its own fleet budget. We're um, including maintenance and replacement. We're recommending that the, uh, the chief and deputies are, are um, assume responsibility for that. And um, that one person has um, responsibility for monitoring all the, the vehicles and where they're at and um, improve uh, coordination. Next slide, please. Right. Um, and working, of course, with uh, fleet maintenance um, to monitor where uh, they're at now. Next slide, please. Um, of course, uh, your emergency vehicle technician would allow you to do a lot more work in-house as opposed to contracting out to specialty um, services that uh, work on fire apparatus. Next slide, please. Right, and of course, so this comes through the, uh, the capital and operating budget process for an AVT. Next. Um, talking about, um, uh, you have um, two non-aerial uh, apparatus at the moment. Um, a platform is much more stable, gives the uh, firefighters a, a safer uh, place to work. Um, and um, for prolonged fires, uh, better ability to, um, to fight the fires. There's many additional capabilities. Next slide, please. So we're recommending that um, um, when you're looking at replacing your next aerial, that you look at a, a platform um, platform truck. Okay, next, um, which is planned for 2023. Any question? Mr. Chair, there's a, a, a question. No, okay. Not yet. When you're done, as soon as you're done, we're gonna start questions. Okay. Um, secondary EOC needs to be updated next. Um, training for your your um, municipal leaders on in who work in the emergency operations center. Next. Um, having someone with some um, emergency management. Um, uh, training who can take a, a greater role in uh, overseeing the emergency management program and updating it. Next. Okay, uh, next. Um, having a remote emergency operation center in an, an adjoining community in case there was a, a major incident along the rail lines or um, um, at the uh, nuclear power plant would allow uh, your operation center to continue. Next slide. Along the same line, same recommendation. Next slide. Um, fire protection agreements need to be updated. Um, Ajax is doing far more assistance to other your neighbors than they are providing for you. Um, and so, your, your plans need to be updated to reflect that and uh, possibly talk about um, cost sharing if you're providing uh, assistance to them. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and it's also talking about automatic aid. So if you do get a high rise fire, um, you're automatically sending resources from, from your neighboring stations to assist you out, to assist you. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Um, so that's something we're recommending uh, in the short term that the chief and deputies work on. Next. Analytic software, again, we, uh, so much of the data that we had to gather had to be done manually and counted and put into Excel spreadsheets and and um, very labor uh, intensive. There's software out there and particularly uh, with the new CAD um, that could solve a lot of these problems. 
um, and give you better data to make decisions moving forward in the future. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, next slide. Okay. Uh, to you, Mr. Chair, um, I'm open for questions. Wonderful. Well, we have quite a few questions and uh, first one will come from Regional Councillor Lee. You have the floor. So thank you for the presentation. Um, can we go back to 2012 when an original FMP was presented? Um, you kind of alluded to issues occurring and um, at the end of the day, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna, I have to ask for more details because um, you know, we're asking in a sense for 20 suppression fighters plus, plus 28 plus support staff. And these are all short term, a lot of them are very much short term asks. So I need to know exactly what happened in 2012 that I think a lot of these issues could have been dealt with nine years ago, but all of a sudden we're dealing with them now. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, um, we were not involved in the in the 2012, um, but you've had a couple different fire chiefs since then. I, I through, would, you, Mr. Chair, through you, Mr. Chair, I would prefer if the fire chief answered that question. Yeah. Yes. yes. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So um, just to give a little bit of history to to the to the regional councilor um, and and all of council and any of the public that didn't know. So several years back, we did do a fire master plan and about the time it was completed and coming to council, the fire chief of the day fell ill. He was off, uh, subsequently off, off the job for about a year and then passed away. Uh, subsequent after that, um, uh, of course, then we had an acting chief for a little while while the exploration for a fire chief was put out. We, we uh, hired a fire chief uh, Sheen from Toronto um, and he was here for a few years. Uh, that situation didn't work out well between him and the town. So um, then he was uh, then left and uh, then I became chief. So just, so that was a bit of the history of why a lot of the recommendations in the past, it wasn't that it was brought forth and nothing was done. It was that things got lost in the mix. One of my uh, first um, objectives when I took over for fire chief was to um, evaluate the department and, um, and look at where we are, where we need to be in the future and what needs to be decided by council. And uh, so the decision was then a few years back to do a updated Fire, master fire plan so that council of today can make the decisions based on the information we have and where we're going to go in the future. So that's basically in a nutshell where we came from and where we are today and what's put us here. I wouldn't say it was, um, it was just, you know, things that happened that brought us to this situation, but today's uh, master fire plan is to show as as Daryl indicated earlier where we're at today and how we can somehow move forward in the future to uh to you know bring things back to where they need to be so hopefully that uh answers that question um thank you it does to a degree through the chair thank you for that response but um you know there's also like you know deputy fire chiefs and again I don't know the full chain of command I'll be very honest but at the same time though it's wouldn't a deputy fire chief have taken on the fire master plan and brought that to the council of the day nine years ago? Because again, you're asking in a sense, short term next year, you know, 20 firefighters onto our operating budget, that's going to be a significant increase on the population, significant increase on this council that we, we had no problem. Like, uh, so sorry, that's not a question. Let me rephrase the question. So chief Lang then, you know, I'm looking at the past two operating budgets. Why didn't we ask for staff then? Why do we necessarily have to? I mean, you you would have known that we weren't at the one per 1,000 that's recommended, right? So why didn't we ask for staff previously to avoid a 20 person hire in one year? Through you, Mr. Chair, I'll answer that question. This Thank is you. EAO. So um, council, as you'll recall, when I got here in the end of 2018, in January of 2019, I reported uh, an assessment, my 100 day assessment to council. And what I, 
communicated to council was that we were, what I had seen was we were behind in a number of areas in, uh, in the town uh, due to, uh, frankly, lack of investment in IT, parks and rec, um, fire and, and so on. And I, I actually listed out a number of those different plans in that report that needed to be either were outdated or needed to be redone. Um, so yes, I, you know, we saw the, the 2012 plan, but frankly, it was far, it was, it was too old as far as I was concerned to be able to start implementing that plan. So I, I put the chief on the direction of, uh, redoing the plan and that's what, that's what we started and that's where we are today. Keeping in mind that, the, but I, that I knew there were a number of plans that were going to be coming forward and it's a matter of, you know, the senior management team trying to phase them in. Um, so that, that was my direction to the chief. So in a sense, um, to, through the chair to CEO Baker, we in a sense instructed the chief, let's wait till the fire master plans out so we see exactly how many firefighters we need to bring on before we add any suppression fighters to the budget. So yes, that's exactly right. And at the end of the day, and the consultant did, did note this at the beginning, that um, despite what the trends are, despite what the consultant says, at the end of the day, council sets the level of service for the town. So there's a lot of different questions that you could ask, you know, uh, you know show us how much the call volume has gone up in the last number of years, or, or show us how many fires you know, you've been fighting in the last number of years. Um, you know, maybe maybe you would like to see more data, but for, for me, the data that was in the 2012 uh, fire master plan was far too outdated. You needed to do another community risk assessment because the, as was noted at the beginning of this presentation as well, your response is based on the risk assessment of the day in the community and your community had grown so much since 2012, the requirements of the fire master plan could have totally been different. So, um, so that was the decision that was made. Um, but it's but to my knowledge, like when did the community risk ass assessment become a legislated thing? It was 2019, was it not? Am I reading that wrong? To whoever can answer this. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, um, that requirement became or it came into place in 2019. However, it was not re is not required. Um, originally, it was to be done by 2022. Um, but with um, COVID, it has been backed up to 2024. And then after that, it's supposed to be an annual thing or is this supposed to be every five years? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, it's to be reviewed annually by the chief and updated every five years. I'm gonna let the rest of the council speak. I think it's important, again, to ensure our tax base understands why we may see a sudden spike uh, this year of all years. Um, I understand, I, you know, I'm a big supporter of fire and everything they do, and I understand it goes beyond fire. We should change the name because you know they're the first responders for car accidents, uh, chemical spills, etc. But to ask for 20 firefighters of this council in a time where we've asked already a lot of our population throughout these three years, I understand, CEO Baker, what you're saying of we were um, deficient in a lot of different categories, but this is probably the biggest ask we will have made of our constituency. Um, and uh, yes, you may have brought this up during your 100 day plan, but I think there's gonna be a degree of surprise to a lot of people who may not have been following this. My last question is ultimately, so we have towers up at Pat Bailey Square, for example. And if I read correctly, the report, they were saying that the association generally suggests 43 firefighters for a high rise. I'm not considered, I'm not sure if that's considered a high rise, but let's say there was a fire at the 14th floor of Pat Bailey Square. How many firefighters are generally recommended and how many do, would we have going to that fire in that case? And I guess that'd be Chief Lang possibly? Yes, I could take on this uh, question and answer it. Um, so currently we respond a minimum of 16 firefighters to all fire calls. Um, we generally have more than that on shift, but that accounts for the minimum staff. Uh, the uh, typical high rise fire, uh, I believe it's up around about 43 that they recommend for properly extinguishing the fire. 
And a lot, a lot of that has to do with the vertical distances, the carrying of equipment up and down and uh, backing up of crews and things like that. So just there's a general, that's why there's a, a larger scope for a large building like a high rise. The, um, we will, or we do um, work on uh, automatic aid and mutual aid agreements with Pickering, Whitby and so on. And we will call them into the, our large fires. They, as you see quite often with the council reports, that uh, we, we advise that, you know, Pickering assisted us, Whitby assisted us at these calls. Uh, even with those additional crews, uh, we still fall short of what the standard re is asking for. So uh, again, it's uh, as, uh, as Daryl has pointed out, um, just simply adding a crew isn't gonna be the solution to, um, you know, all our problems. Uh, we need to come up with a plan similar to what I believe you stated earlier is we have to have a plan that discusses it on an annual basis to ensure we don't fall behind and ensure we get to where we need to be without a large hit on the, on the taxpayers. Uh, several small increments over several years is much better. And that's definitely one of the uh, reasons we're going to be coming to council with an annual report um, from the fire service in the future is to state, yes, Here's where we are, here's where we need to be, and here's the path to get there. And then continuing to adopt that with council on what we can and can't do through the fire service. And sorry, just to be a bit more specific, and I appreciate the, that, that answer, how short are we? So let's say we call in staff from Pickering and Whitby for a 14th floor fire at Pabili Square. How, how, how many, ideally, in the best case scenario, 42 or 43 is the recommended, how many would we have on site? Uh, would, I mean, we would start off with, uh, we usually ask for one or one from each, uh, one truck, which would be four firefighters from each. So if we've got the 16 and, and we bring in another eight, that's, uh, that's basically where we're starting. We can upgrade from there. We do have mutual aid with the entire region. So we can ask for more trucks from others. So we may be able to get another couple of trucks from other departments, maybe another, a second from Whitby or Pickering or one from Oshawa. So then, then that's basically taken our 16 staff to double, which is 32. So we're still shy of the 43. Um, as I said, so we're not, we're not going to fix a problem just by hiring a crew. What we are going to do though is be in better shape and uh, increase that, uh, as I said, that a level of same, you know, 32 up another crew. So now we're at 36. Um, and that's going to get us to close to where we need to be. Uh, I'm not going to suggest that every fire service in Ontario or even North America can be right at the standard. But as you saw in the charts, um, when you get too far down, then the risk is ex extremely high rather than bringing the risk to a moderate level. Okay, I appreciate the response. Um, thank you, Chair. Those are my questions. Thank you, Councillor Lee. Thank you, Chief. Um, Mayor Collier, it's all yours. Thank you, Chair. Through you to um, probably multiple staff. First, um, Mr. Cully, I apologize for cutting you off. It's just, I think we all thoroughly understood that we have a problem here and we need to, we need to get on with it. Um, and, and that's what I was attempting to do. But thank you for your presentation. I, I'm very concerned. Um, having been here for a while, I, I did go through the last fire master plan I remember when we built the fire hall in 2008, the new fire headquarters in 2008, uh, LEED certified state of the art. And when we hired and um, outfitted that fire hall, we were told on council at the time that those are the last firefighters we were gonna need to hire in Ajax, that that would be a full complement, and that would be enough to satisfy our needs until growing. And I think Councillor Dyes will probably remember that same conversation. Um, so to find out now that we are so far behind is, is very troubling, especially as Councillor Lee stated, we've, we've already done a big catch up in the 2018 budget because we, we decided just to rip the bandaid off and bite the bullet and, and make that big staff investment. I think it was 18 new staff at the time because we hadn't hired in a while and we've gotten behind, but this is really the first I'm hearing that fire is behind. So 
the first you open with 2012 and I'm just not completely clear the 2012 fire master plan and probably this will be to the chief and I know you weren't here um, but one of the first slides was you know none of, or very little of the 2012 fire master plan was implemented were there any asks in the 2012 fire master plan for more firefighters Yes, this is the fire chief uh, through the chair to the mayor. Yes, there was uh, there was asks through the master fire plan that was presented to council that uh, they did ask for firefighters. Um, the way they worded it was an additional crew. They didn't say, I believe, specific numbers. They said an additional crew. I was just looking for the exact wording in the plan, but um, by additional crew, it's, it it would be twenty because we uh, we ship we put five on each platoon and there's four platoons. So there was a, the recommendation at that time that we increase by the crew, uh, additional crew of firefighters in the suppression area to, uh, to, through the master fire plan. Okay, but we also, between then and now, have gone to the 24-hour shift. Did that have any effect on, on response or the number of crews available? Through chair to the mayor. No, uh, tw they, they worked. They used to work 10 and 14 shifts, which have now become 24 hour shifts, but the amount of firefighters and the amount on each platoon remain the same. At that point, uh, we were minimum 16 and now we're minimum 16 as well. Okay, over the, over the last 10 years, has there been an instance like, I, I, I feel and I my understanding is that, that Ajax Fire have been able to to manage and to serve the community. Has there been any times over the last 10 years where Ajax Fire has not been able to meet the demands based on the current contingent or the current uh, makeup of staff? Uh, yes, um, if I could, I, I don't mind answering. I'm gonna put it to this question if I can to, to Deputy Burge only because he has a few more stats than I do. Um, and his and he's got a list of them there with him. Uh, so I'll, I would like to ask him first if if he has an answer to this, and then if not, I can come back to me. Go ahead, uh, Deputy. Uh, through the chair, Sir Mayor Collier. Yeah, one thing we we have recognized is our concurrent call volumes. So when I refer to concurrent call volumes, what I'm talking about is when you have multiple emergencies happening at one point in time. So percentage wise, prior to the pandemic, we were about. Um, we had approximately uh, a number of incidents where basically, especially windstorms, things like that, where you had the calls stacking up. At times you would have 15, 20 calls stacked up. So through the fire master plan, there is statistics on the concurrent call volumes and how often that's happened. It has dropped through the, uh, it's in, I'll pull up the page number for you, Mr. Mayor. It is on page 93 of the fire master plan where it details the concurrent call volumes and some of the times where we've had issues. An example would be on September 21st, 2018, between 1730 hours and 2248 hours, which is approximately five hours, there are 39 separate incidents. So during those time periods, we're stacked up on calls. And if you go to the next page of the fire master plan, it actually gives you the percentages from 2013 to 2020, it's page 94 of the fire master plan where it talks about the percentage of all calls that are concurrent. So in 2019, the percentage was 31.5. So what that's referring to is when you have one fire apparatus is already tied up at a call and another call comes in. So based on that, we're already starting anywhere from four to eight personnel below that 16 running to another response. In 2020, that percentage dropped to 26.6% due to a reduction in call volume as a result of the pandemic. I, I really don't know know where to go on this. I mean, it, it's it's a bit overwhelming. I'm I was very concerned, Chief, when you used the words "lost in the mix." Um, I, I, you know, that can't happen. You know, we have we had the 2012 Fire Master Plan. I understand um, Chief Diot passed away in 2014, and then we had um, Chief Sheen, then yourself. But regardless. 
I mean, this council and the past four councils I've been on have never questioned or even really looked twice at the fire budget when it comes before us at budget time. And I've done 19 budgets here, uh, or 18 budgets here, sorry. And except for the last one where we took out, I think, was it 30 or 60 grand for a consultant for buying a fire truck? That's the only change that I'm aware of that we've ever made to a fire budget in my 18 years. And that was very minor and nothing to do with staff. Other than that, everything has been approved. So I'm very concerned about the comment lost in the mix because, you know, had we been aware of this, had it come forward in the budget, we wouldn't be in this situation. And, and that's a big breakdown in our system. How are we going to ensure that this doesn't happen again? I mean, you're going to be, I assume we're going to support the recommendation, which is you report back at budget with a phased in approach of how we catch up. But I mean, we have phased in approaches of a lot of things like our IT master plan, for instance, that is stretching us very, very thin. I, I It's put us in a very, very bad situation. And Council Lee is right. I don't know how we go to our residents and tell them, you know, in order to hire and 20, 20 plus eight, so 28, because they both are short term. I don't know what short term is. You know, a 7% increase in our budget. 7%, 5 million bucks. Like that's that's a lot. That's what's that's not even including the part of the equipment that's in this. That's if we were to do everything that's outlined here. Uh, that that is something very very significant. I, I guess that's not even really a question. I mean, how do we stop this from happening again, Chief? Okay, uh, through through the chair to the mayor. Um, as I said earlier, I said uh, unfortunately there is some bad news in this. Uh, master fire plan for, for council. And uh, I think we just need to make sure that we have identified everything. And that's what I believe they've done in the fire master plan is identified where we are today and where we, what we need to consider and look at. Um, this, the second part, I think the most important question you asked there was uh, how are we gonna make sure that we once we fix it, we don't uh, get it back into that situation? And I believe the answer is uh, exactly what we have suggested and what the, the consultants have brought back is that it is reported to council on an annual basis. Council understands where our community risk ass assessment has, made, has changed. Council understands on an annual basis where we've got to within the recommendations of this um, fire master plan so that on an annual basis it is updated and is reported to council so that you, you understand the difficulties or the concerns come budget time. So I think that uh, that hasn't been done in the past. Uh, we believe it's it's valuable on an, uh, that annual basis versus getting it every five or seven years type of thing, but certainly on the annual basis that will be going forward and reported to council. Okay, uh, I want to go back to Mr. Cully for a minute, slide 47, you said there's no actual standard as far as how many firefighters per population. It's sort of a general rule of thumb. I find that very troubling. I mean, why isn't there an actual standard? We're being presented with some very large numbers here today, but um, you know, what, what does Sterling say the other, the unwritten rules of baseball? I mean, why is there not a, a absolute across the board standard and just a general rule of thumb. I have a problem with general rule of thumb. I mean, I, I have, I didn't read all 400 pages, uh, Aaron, of the, of the whole plan. <laughs> so I didn't read page 94 where you talked about the, those specifics or recall that, but I'm not aware of, of, of a call that we weren't like a fire call. I understand a windstorm or something where you've got multiples, but I'm not aware of a fire or something that or a fatality or anything like that that happened because we weren't able to respond. So when when we have a rule of thumb, I mean, I, I do I do agree that we probably need to look at more staff, but to base it on a rule of thumb, I have an issue with. Mr. Piccoli, can you speak to why there is no no absolute standard for this? Because I would think there would need to be. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to the mayor. Um, 
the provincial legislation uh, basically states that it's up to council, each council to determine the level of service that they provide. Uh, you know, their rule of thumb, it's more of common practice. Um, where have fire departments uh, through the years found the experience to determine, you know, where that balance is, is where that number has come from. However, um, you know, there is no legislation. The only legislation is council sets the, the level of service that you provide. Um, and, and that's provincial, you know, um, that's what's in the, the provincial legislation. Well, there's another, I think, fatal flaw in the system, because if they're going to have the overriding body that looks at the whole thing, they should be determining these things, not leaving it up to individual councils that are, uh, let's be honest, concerned about bringing in a big tax number because we are elected officials. I don't think that's the right way that this should go. I mean, if there is a standard that has to be met, there's a standard that has to be met. And I don't think it should be open to discretion. That's, an, that's another matter for another election. We, I realize we're going to have more high density. And to build on Council Lee's comments about Pat Bailey Square, I've read a few reports and I'm not aware that there is any number that can really satisfy a high rise fire. I don't even think 43 is enough to fully satisfy a high. Is that, is that fair? that regardless of how many you have, there are situations when you're dealing with high rise that you're just not gonna be able to deal with, Chief? Sorry, I was just trying to get my video up. Uh, through the chair to the mayor. Uh, yes and no, I, I, I think, and as I, I reported to council when uh, early back in uh, 2019 that we, you know, we've been, we're short on firefighters and that, um, and that we're going through this plan and we're going to bring you all the information as we've done so that the proper decisions can be made moving forward. From a high rise perspective, from a house perspective or from any other perspective of fires, what I stated is we have a very good uh, firefighter uh, sector in, in the town, the fire service. We have a lot of good pe people. We will always do what we can. The concern when you have the lack of staff is that it can get away from you. A larger building, an industrial type fire or a high rise fire, if it gets away from us with our limited staff, we are going to lose the building. Um, there's just, there's not gonna be a way to get it back. And that's why when they, when you see the standards and the recommendations for staffing and so on, it's to properly do all the steps of the, <clears throat> of the fire containment and protecting of exposures and extinguishment and rescues and so on. And you're gonna have varying degree of fires. You're gonna have a kitchen fire that we can go in and just put out and it's, it doesn't extend. We're gonna have garage fires that extend to three homes. So we will always, and we have in the past, and we will continue to do the best we can, but with limited resources, then unfortunately what we've seen and what the numbers show in the, in the charts we've supplied in the fire master plan is the fire loss is up, the, the, the dollar losses are up, exposures are up, and those are contributed mostly to not enough staff to do all the different jobs when we arrive on scene. So if we're going to limit ourselves, then we're gonna to have to expect that continues to grow and that continues to be a concern. When, when, when you see dollar losses go up, when you see um, exposures increasing uh, and so on, then you're also gonna see, that's what the fuss rates that were talked about within the uh, fire master plan, the insurance rates are gonna go up. So the, the key is finding that balance of whether the taxpayer is going to pay hundreds of dollars more a year in insurance or where they're going to pay a little bit more a year in taxes and it all balances out and makes it for an even living. Um, there's no perfect formula. Uh, so as I said, from a high rise perspective, again, with every, as with every other call, the, the firefighters that do attend 
and the assistance we get from other municipalities, they will do their best, but there's, you know, there's, it's going to be where we're going to see things get away from us more. And that's, that's going to be unfortunate. So just on that. So if it's up to individual councils to decide the level of service, does that put us in a, I mean, we all have fire insurance, I'm sure, hopefully. Does that put us in a, as a municipality in a liability position if there's a full loss of a building and the insurance company is, is forced to pay, which they should, um, but they turn around and say, well, Ajax Fire only has, what was the number, 0.82 per thousand, or 82 per thousand, where, you know, 0.82 per thousand, where would be as 0.96 or 0.99, whatever it was. And therefore, we were negligent, and we're going to now come after the municipality. Through, through you, Mr. Chair, um, can, I, I would like to answer that question. Um, so, uh, you know, whenever there's a, a large loss, whatever is, is the cause is, whether it's fire or other, people will argue and uh, and and sue and fight. And I think it's I think it's very difficult for us to to be able to answer that question. Yes, when insurance companies pay out, they are looking for whatever angle they can to try and uh, recoup some of their losses. So um, I think it's I think it's safe to say that even if we had all of our firefighters, uh, when I was a fire chief, we we you know when we responded to a call and we did everything we possibly could and we were perfectly uh, um, we were adequately resourced. Um, we still you know the fire the the insurance companies still tried to reduce the, the amount of money that they were that they were paying. Can I I would like to go back to the last question if I could though, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, you were asking about um, high rise. Yeah, if there were. If there was ever a situation where we wouldn't be fully staffed, I, I think uh, I, I have to weigh in on that one. I, I, when you look at you know large fires in the in the city of Toronto, for instance, you hear about anywhere up to you know twenty five. They have they have a six alarm system, so depending on the size of a call, so uh, let's say it's an industrial building, they might do a two or three alarm, and every every, every alarm is a certain number of trucks. So a couple of pumpers, an aerial, a rescue truck, and so on. Depending on the size of the fire or how it's progressing, then they will increase the number of alarms. They'll go up to a six alarm, which is between 25 and 29 trucks. They can do that because they've amalgamated across the city of Toronto. I could tell you when I started in the city of Scarborough, which is now part of the city of Toronto, uh, we only had 15 trucks. And that was a large department. We had 550 firefighters. And if we had a large fire like that, we, you know, I remember we had a lumber yard fire and so on. We had to get mutual aid from other municipalities. So, so in Ajax is nowhere near the size of the Scarborough Fire Department. So I would say that the answer is yes, there will always be a situation where you're going to need there could be situations where you're going to need help. And that's what mutual aid is for. Um, so it, I think what we're looking at here and, you know, you know, I'd like the chief and deputy to, to speak up as well, but what, what we're trying to do is increase our ability to respond as a first responder to a house fire or to an apartment fire and so on, and be able to adequately, uh, get in and rescue and do the things that we need to do until we receive the help that we get from outside resources. That's what's being asked for here. Would that be accurate, Chief? Because there's absolutely no way that Ajax will ever have 25 fire trucks or, or, or 16, 20 fire trucks uh, to be able to, to um, you know, fight a school fire or a high rise fire or, uh, or uh, you know, if, uh, um, you know, Amazon went up. I mean, we'd be calling fire trucks from, you know, Alberta for crying out loud. I mean, it's, it's a million square feet. It, it doesn't make sense that Ajax would ever grow to the size of a fire department to be able to manage that fire. Thank you, CEO Baker. That's, that's helpful because that's, that's kind of what I'm thinking. And that's why we have mutual aid. Um, and, and we, I'm sure, go to Pickering and Whitby as well. When they when they need something or when there's a big accident on the 401 for instance that that's that's how the system works so thank you for that that that's helpful i, I just to wrap it up um, when you say short term mr kelly what what are you talking about short term 
when you use short term, mid term, long term in your um, for the 36 asked. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to Mr. Mayor, um, short term uh, we've defined as one to three years, mid term four to six years, and long term is seven to ten years. Okay, so in the one to three years, uh, I guess back to the chief, you're looking at 20 firefighters, which would be one truck, and then eight firefighters are both short term in the report. So 28, because short term is one to three years. So if we hire 20 for one truck, what is that going to give us? Because looking at slide um, 52, page 53, recommendation 24, the location gaps. I mean, we're still not going to have another fire hall. We're still not going to be any closer to those calls, even if we have another crew and another truck. So what benefit is that going to give us to the residents of the town of Ajax immediately, please? Again, I think I will uh, just ask, uh, first of all, if uh, Deputy Chief Aaron Burris wants to have a little bit of weigh-in on this, and then I'll, I'll come back at the end. Okay. Thank you, Chief. Um, so as Daryl alluded to earlier, through the chair to Mayor Collier, as, as Daryl alluded to earlier um, in his presentation, when you're looking at the NFPA standards for a single family dwelling house fire, we'll say, um, it, the NFPA recommends 17 firefighters on scene. So by moving from a minimum of 16 staff up to 20, which that uh, full-time staff would, the additional 20 would give you, it gives you that additional capacity to handle your residential house fires better. In addition to that, when you get those concurrent calls, you have more staff available. So that, that assists you even more greatly with your personnel who assemble on scene of an emergency scene. Then you look at, start looking at the NFPA standards for strip plazas where it recommends 27 firefighters on scene. So we're getting that much closer, not just to the high rises, but also looking at your small apartment style fires, your strip plazas, more firefighters on scene, better able you to mitigate the emergency in a more efficient manner, which then affects fire loss. So by affecting the fire loss, the risk to the businesses and the community is reduced as well. Um, I will pass this over to the chief now because I know he had some comments. But just to just before that, but it won't help us in those areas that are on the ovals there, those location gaps, as far as getting there within the four minutes, because they're still going to come from the same stations. Through, through the chair to Mayor Collier, you are correct. You, you won't speed up the time that you get there, but when you do have additional staff there, they can help mitigate the emergency because there are more, more, more hands basically in the pile makes the job uh, happen that much more efficiently in a fire scene. Chief? Yeah, thank you, uh, Deputy Chief uh, Burns. Uh, the only thing I would add uh, through through the chair to the mayor is um, one of the big things and that what we pointed out is the concurrent calls. Uh, again, it's, uh, you know, when we're hitting the 30% uh, marker, then we start to get concerned in the fire service when we're amid the, what, what it really means when we talk about not having staffed for concurrent calls is if we've got two fire trucks at a car accident, an additional car accident comes in or other concerns or people are calling us to their house for CO alarms and so on. Um, even even you know, additional small fires and so on. We spread ourselves to a point where people on the, and the taxpayers are waiting uh, for us to show up at their house. We've had some calls where people have waited half an hour, even though we're calling in and using our neighbors, Pickering and Whitby on uh, mutual aid, uh, we can still have the delays. And the delays in those calls may be okay, maybe not, uh, really depends on the, on the type of call. But when we are getting into those concurrent calls and the delays of, of getting, uh, what we're really gonna see with the additional crew is a reduction of the waiting or the you know the the delays to those concurrent calls, as well as what what uh, Deputy Chief Burge already pointed out. But when there's a large call, don't you dispatch all the trucks immediately? Request the mutual aid. 
Yes, uh, through the through the chair to the mayor. Basically, yes. Uh, we what we have is we have a, a first a first alarm uh, that complement that goes to any any call any fire call. Um, if the fire call is confirmed en route, then we increase it to the uh, the last truck that we have. Uh, so we have all vehicles going to that call, and then we start uh, to uh, once the incident commander gets on scene, they'll make the determination for if there's assistance required from our neighbors. Uh, but again, um, so during that say five minute time, another call comes in, then a truck needs to be rerouted, which reduces our staff again at the call that we're originally going to. So it's, it's a little complex, but it's um, it, in, in order to serve the calls, we need to spread ourselves thin right now. And, and certainly in the next crew uh, will help. One of the other things we do currently now is um, the aerial is not always available to go to a fire call, for example, uh, because the aerial crew may be on the rescue truck because they're doing multiple trucks for with one crew. So therefore they don't, the aerials in the station with no staff to, to, to bring it to the call. So we're, we're struggling with those type of difficulties over the last bunch of years and we we really need to have a dedicated crew for the aerial and the rescue so that we can serve the calls within the town properly and efficiently okay so so the 20 the extra truck what about the other eight okay uh, deputy bird did you want to speak about that yeah so as, as the consultant was alluding to that extra eight through the chair to Mayor Collier, as the consultant was alluding to that extra eight will bring you an additional two firefighters per platoon, which helps to bring you more in a line with that firefighter per 1000. Those additional two, fi two firefighters also bump you up against the NFPA standards a little bit higher. So you have two more firefighters thus bringing you closer to reaching those NFPA standards, which, which, which is helpful because as the number of years have gone on, you know, our, we have more and more challenges to our staffing. Um, just to maintaining minimum staffing at times can be difficult. There's more forms of leave, you know, more firefighters than ever are taking parental and maternity leave. So there's ongoing challenges to our staffing and having those additional two will assist us with, with more of a buffer to help maintain a higher minimum staffing level. Okay. All right, those, those are my questions, I'll just, be quickly to it. I, I'm, I'm kind of frustrated that we're at this, this, this position. Um, the NFPA standards, I, I have trouble putting a lot of, of weight in because, I mean, we've learned there's no standard. It's a, it's a rule of thumb. Until somebody comes out with set kind of criteria, I think then that has a little more teeth to it. My main concern is making sure Ajax residents are protected and making sure that, that falls don't drop. I understand we need to do some work, um, but as far as doing everything that's put here, I mean, it's a wish list. I understand you have to ask <laughs> for everything, but I mean, I, I guess what I want to see, Chief, when you come back nearer budget time, I'd rather have a briefing before budget time. I don't want to just see this beyond the budget. I'd like to, I think, have council have another GGC update sometime, maybe around December, January where we vetted out the top priorities and the must have items and exactly what that's gonna cost us and exactly the time frame, and exactly what the benefit that's going to be to the residents. Uh, Cause that's what we have to show here. We have to be able to justify this to the residents. This is gonna be a significant tax hit to them and uh, they have to see the benefits. So, I would ask for that probably sometime in December or January. And I think you probably would be doing that anyway, but just want to want to say that publicly. And uh, yeah, I'm not looking forward to it. I'll leave her there. Thank you, Chair. You're welcome, Mr. Mayor. Thanks for the conversation and participation, <coughs> uh, staff. Um, next for questions would be uh, Councillor Tyler Moore. Thank you, right. uh, Chair. And, and um, I am going to you know, ask a question or two, but I, I have a comment. I have some comments. I, I appreciate that uh, Regional Councillor Lee and Mayor Collier have asked a lot of the hard questions already. But I can tell you that when I'm speaking to residents, uh, you know, I'm so proud of the fire service. I know it's not an easy gig. I know when the, when the bell rings, 
we're all at home asleep. You guys are doing, and men and women are doing the heavy work. It's also interesting whenever we discuss property tax with, with, uh, with residents and they understand that the local portion goes for the fire service and they always say, oh, okay, well, that's good. Like they're, they're, they're proud to pay into it. They're happy to pay into it. But when you, when you say that council sets the level of service for fire and emergency provides, I mean, you got to understand that from a, a, you know, like a local counselor like me who gets into this situation and always tries to, or this, this job, I should say, and always tries to look through the, the, the eyes of the residents. Um, you know, I always explain to them that, you know, we have planning, we have budgets, we have operations, we have recreations, we have fire. And, and how much we depend on, on the staff and how worthy it is to have the staff there. So I know you guys are in a tough spot. I know you're in a tough spot. And I know that somebody's got to do this at some point to say, okay, we're underemployed. But as Regional Counselor Lee indicated, a nine-year gap in that. And you know how I feel personally about everyone and how Shane Baker is a former chief. So it's great to have that perspective. But a nine-year gap, uh, you know, uh, Mark Diotti, former uh, uh, fire chief died in 2014. I was at the funeral. You know, a lot of time has passed since then. And it just seems like we're getting this huge mountain, you know, thrown in the taxpayers at this time. You've already heard that. Um, so we're going to have to try and mitigate this as, you know, softly as we can. My questions being, um, when I, on page uh, 59 of your report, you mentioned 300 vehicles. Was that uh, municipal vehicles owned by the town or is that actual you know fire pickup trucks and engines and pumpers and it, does fire own 300 vehicles uh, th through you mr chair um the uh no that's the approximate size of the entire town fleet okay uh, the, okay. the fire service is is a very small percentage of that it, okay it, yeah yeah just reflecting how much work your fleet maintenance staff have to do. Yeah, no, no, that, that's relevant. And I like the idea of having somebody on staff. Again, I'm not an expert that could do it in-house because there's certainly enough vehicles. I have friends of mine that are small engine mechanics that work at golf courses and they have 150 pieces. If you include all the grass cutting equipment and the golf carts, everything. So it, it, and they have in-house, uh, you know, golf courses. So uh, my next question is, the one to three years, which is really what we're dealing with on this day and, and, and the initial ask, um, is it under, my understanding that you're asking for 28 new hires uh, over one to three years? Is that is that correct, uh, including service staff and firefighters? Was, was that the ask-ish uh, the goal? Through you, Mr. Chair, um, yes, 28 suppression firefighters in one to three okay. years. Wow. Whew. And um, is is a mutual aid kind of a band aid, a B option, whilst we maybe slow down those? Uh, you know, I don't know. Is that is that something that you can count on to the point where obviously we never want to have the service uh, compromised uh, for the you know for the residents of Ajax. I'm one of them. We're all one of them. But I guess mutual aid is is another way. I guess maybe the, the way you have been dealing with it, Chief. Uh, through the chair. Uh, yeah, if you could just expand on mutual aid a little bit, because it's uh, interesting, you know, that we have a lot of fires around us, fire services around us. Uh, my question to the chief. Yes, uh, through the chair to the counselor. Um, yes, the mutual aid has been used, as you can see from the graphs in the fire master plan, a lot. It does get used a lot. It's, uh, we have a regional mutual aid agreement for in Durham region, where we all support and back up each other. We will continue to use that. It is a very good tool in the toolbox. It's not the answer to everything, but it's a good tool. Uh, we have been using it very successfully over the years, and I do not foresee that that would uh, change. We would, even with additional staffing, we will never be, as, as CEO Baker pointed out, we'll never be to where the city of Toronto is in places like that, or even larger uh, municipalities. Um, but the, definitely the use of the mutual aid assists us in getting some of our numbers up, makes the job a little safer, and also um, hopefully it makes it uh, more efficient and uh, we, we can actually do a better job with more numbers. 
Okay, uh, thanks for answering that question because you know when we talk when we're talking to residents, which we often do, and you 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 rarely do in that capacity. You just, then it's good to know that 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 if the numbers are a little bit down, we are sort of making things work via mutual aid. Uh, okay, that's all my questions. I'm sure there's lots more, but again, thanks for all the work you guys do and uh, men and women do, I should say. And uh, yeah, it's it, this is a tough, really tough situation. And I, and I am sad that we're we have to be in this, you know. Yeah, I don't know how we got here, but uh, tough. Thank you, Councillor Talamore, and thank you, um, Regional Councillor Crawford. Yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this report makes me want to scream into a pillow. Just going to say, uh, my blood pressure has raised so high I'm going to have to spend the next week at Greenwood. Uh, I just, uh, this, especially when I believe that this could have been avoided. Uh, the ask was there in 2012. Uh, I realized lots of things when was go were going on in the fire department. I realized lots of things were happening at the town. But the reality is, is I have sat through, um, I've been on since 2018, 12 budgets that I have never seen and ask for increasing staffing uh, for the fire department. So uh, I am uh, I'm extremely disappointed that this is where it's come to at this point. And I'm extremely sorry that our, our first responders have had to deal uh, with the situation uh, being understaffed. I firmly believe you don't need a master plan to know whether or not you've got staffing or not. You either have them or you don't. You don't need a master plan to come back to us to say, guys, like we're suffering, we need something. Uh, and so I don't know where the miscommunication happened. I don't know why the ask was never done. I realized that uh, at the 100 day report from the CAO, we were alerted that there were uh, there were going to be issues. However, that was over 600 days ago. Uh, lots gone on, a lot of water's gone under the bridge in 600 days. And perhaps there needed to be a, a reminder of those things. Um, to have this master plan come now is, uh, we got one more budget left in this term. Um, and so, uh, uh, there's probably not enough words in the English language at this point for me to go like, what, what? Uh, I, um, I, 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 in some ways I'm rendered speechless and in some ways there's just words that I can't even say. Uh, so anyway, I just, um, uh, I'm disappointed uh, that, that, that it's come to this point 28 people, 7% uh, increase in taxes, just alone on that, at a point where we don't receive money from a, a casino, uh, where, you know, where our, everybody is already taxed. I'm telling you, it is blowing my brain at this point. And I, um, like I said, I'm going to spend a lot of time at Greenwood these days. So I, I want to say, uh, uh, I apologize to the first responders and I thank them for the work that they do every day. Um, I don't know if you follow our uh, comprehensive review on where the town is going, but I uh, gotta tell you that Pat Valley Square is not gonna be the first and only apartment building that we have. If that doesn't alert you that there's gonna be apartment buildings likely popping up all over the place uh, over the next five to 10 years, uh, that, that has to be uh, part of the overall plan, um, like, uh, <laughs> I know I'm babbling like an idiot, but, uh, this is, if we are not working together as we grow this town, then we cannot have these kinds of surprises all the time. You work for us. Like we need to know this information long before now, as we set our plans in place. And so um, I really hope uh, from this point, obviously 28 bodies are not gonna be able to go into one budget that has to go over time. But uh, I, I just, um, I really hope at this point that this becomes uh, a joint effort as again, as we grow this town, it can't be a surprise to anybody that the town has exploded over the past 
uh, 10 years and yet our fire department has not increased its complement. That can't be a surprise to anybody. Uh, and yet we have never seen an ask in a budget for an increase in the complement of staff. And that to me is, uh, is just, it's irresponsible, uh, both from previous staff uh, and I guess even to now, because uh, I don't know, I, you say council is responsible for the amount of uh, fire police or fire people we have. I'm sorry, I wasn't, a, I'm not a fire person. I have, uh, I don't think there's anybody on our council that is qualified or equipped to make those kinds of decisions on their own. And if we're presented with a fire plan in 2012 that said 20 people should have been added at that time, then at the very least, it's not my responsibility to say, oh, by the way, you know, it should have been brought to council in 2013 to say, oh, by the way, the fire plan said it should have been there then. We would not have been here today if we had followed up on the plan in 2012. Sorry. Okay. I have to stop now. Um, I'm done. I have no questions. That is just my comments. Thank you for your comments, Regional Councillor Crawford. Um, with all this uh, discussions, I hope we can come to a happy medium and some form of negotiation and finding the right number. Um, on that, uh, Councillor Bauer, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. I'm a little nervous to follow Regional Councillor Crawford, but I do appreciate all of those comments. Thank you for this report. It was very shocking to read. Um, it, it does raise a lot of questions. Thank you to my colleagues who've already asked a lot of the questions that I had. Um, I do have a few others. So Mr. Kelly, I think during the presentation when, you, when we were talking uh, about mutual aid, you did make a comment that we have helped our neighbors more than our neighbors have helped us. So I just wanna confirm that that is what, what I heard, but, and then ask why is that if we're coming here with you know, 0.66 complement, um, does that mean we didn't need the help or we were so understaffed but we were able to handle it or, or why is that? Uh, through, through the chair um, to Councillor Bauer, I can, I can handle this question. Thank you. When we're talking about the mutual aid uh, responses and requests that's covered under page 145 of the fire master plan. Um, through the fire master plan, they also talk about how a lot of these agreements are quite outdated. That's part and parcel of part of the problem. We have to go back and have those those uh, agreements updated. Uh, we have explored that in the past, and there hasn't really been much of a political appetite from some of our municipal partners to go down that road, but we're hoping following this fire master plan, we will have uh, more success with that process. Thank you for that, Deputy um, Deputy Chief Burge. So, does I I still am not sure I understand why why um, it is that we have not required more help if we are so understaffed, but we've been able to give more help to our neighboring um, fire stations. Is that is that what I heard during the presentation? Though maybe I maybe I didn't understand that right. Through the chair to Councillor Bauer, you are you are correct. We, if you look at the statistics in the fire master plan, we have yeah. given more uh, assistance through mutual aid to our partners. The chart clearly shows it, it is quite uh, quite transparent of the amount of help that we have given them. Yeah. And part of part of the way to deal with the mechanisms is we have to go back to the drawing board and really re-explore our mutual aid agreements, and look at different ways and efficiencies in regards to our mutual aid program and areas that we can better cover through mutual aid. So it's not a matter of we didn't need that help. It's a matter of the contracting of mutual aid where we were not, I guess, where we're signed up more to, to help more than to receive the help. And I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't um, thoroughly look at that the chart that you're talking about. Through, through the share to uh, uh, Councillor Bauer. Yeah, it, a lot of it has to do with the agreements and just sometimes it can be the asks as well, uh, depending on call volumes, things like that. So, you know, part of what we need to do following this as through the recommendations of the fire master plan is to really go back to the drawing board, look at our agreements, find ways that we can improve them to help 
balance out that level. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. Um, I also wanted to ask about the um, safe haven concept. I think that was recommendation 25. I really like that idea. I think I've always thought as a, like from growing up that the fire stations are the hubs of communities. Um, can somebody speak to that a little bit about what that is? I think we, I'm not sure that we have it here yet or we, we wanted to have it here, but we haven't. What does that mean? How would that be used? And what would you expect to see as results of a successful safe haven? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Bauer, I think this question would be better addressed by Daryl from the MT. Thank you. Uh, through you, uh, Chair, um, a, a safe haven is in using the vestibule of the fire station and putting a phone inside where somebody in distress um, could easily go in um, and call for assistance. Um, they typically have a camera monitoring them, that sort of thing. They're not, we're not looking at a, a significant investment. Um, you know, we've seen typically $5,000 per station. Um, at, but it, so at the headquarters, currently there's that ability to go within that vestibule and pick up the phone and talk to the dispatcher. By adding it to the other stations, it gives people an opportunity. Um, if they're feeling unsafe, uh, they need to communicate to somebody, um, you know, to reach out. Firefighters are not always at the station, and um, this, this gives them the ability to have people in the community, the ability to have instant access to assistance. Okay, so that would be for emerge, like it would be a substitute for 911? Well, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, the, um, people often <laughs> don't want to call 911 or, um, you know, they're on the street um, and, and they're looking for assistance. Uh, there, there's a number of, of reasons why people may may feel that they, they need to call for help. They may not have, um, because of their, their situation, they might not have a phone or they may be, um, um, you know, fleeing a situation, a domestic violence situation, et cetera. Um, where they've just left and they don't know where to turn. The fire station is often seen as that safe place. And by being able to get there and pick up a phone that rings into the dispatch center, which you've already got staffed, um, that dispatcher can assess the, the situation and, and provide them, you know, or call for the, the sort of assistance that they need at the time. Okay, thank you. So we, there is a phone or that service available to um, headquarters, has that been used a lot? Are there any stats on that? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, um, I'm not aware of um, the, the number of times it's been used. Uh, and keeping in mind headquarters is more of a, a, a rural, or a rural, suburban residential area um versus you know your number one station or or, or your um, your number two station which are are in areas where um, people don't have the, the the same resources perhaps right okay thank you thank you for that explanation um and my my other question was um about recommendation number 31 and the lack of completed training for emergency management training um, of all required staff. So, and, it's, and it sounds like in that presentation that that's been an ongoing issue for years. So I just would like to ask, is that required training? Why is that something that's sort of fallen through the cracks over the years? And when was the last time that all required staff completed that training? Because it sounds like it's probably important if it has the word emergency in it. Uh, through you, Chair. Um, thank you for that question. Through the um, Emergency Management Act, it is required that every municipality uh, have an emergency control group. That control group is made up of your, your senior 
um, staff members who are assigned to that group. They are required on an annual basis to do an annual training and an annual tabletop exercise. Um, that had, was waived for um, last year due to, due to the pandemic. Um, going back previous to that, um, when we look at the number of staff who actually attend versus the number of staff who are on the team, um, there's a shortfall. So whether, you know, um, emergency management, it's much like a fire department, people don't think about it until they need it. Mm -hmm. and, and so sometimes our, our municipal staff are extremely busy, they've got multiple priorities and, uh, um, you know, they're unable to attend or do not attend. Um, and basically the recommendation is to, to reaffirm the importance of that process. Typically it's a one day, you know, a half day training with a half day exercise. Um, typically it, it's one day, but uh, many times people find it difficult to pull that one day out. Um, we certainly support the legislation in, in the priority and importance of it. Okay. Yeah, so do I. So I think that's probably something that, uh, a good recommendation that everybody who's supposed to attend that and, and take care of that should, should do that. I think I saw the chief's hand go up, Chair, if you don't mind. Yes, thank you, uh, through the chair to Councilor Bauer. Just a little bit more on the emergency management, and I thank Farrell for the comments there. Um, what we're what we're finding in the town, and, and as you can realize, it's not fire that does emergency management in the town; it's the entire town and the uh, directors and so on. And I think <clears throat> from a lot of the discussions we had prior to the recommendation, is that we really need to make sure that everybody. Uh, the directors, uh, the managers, and even some supervisors have it in their work schedule. There's, there is the annual training we do, but there's a, a bunch of other uh, areas that they participate in, working groups um, and other training sessions uh, provincially and federally that are out there for to understand emergency management a little bit better. But it really needs to become part of everyone's portfolio for their job. And I think that's what the recommendation of the increased training and, and, and support is that it's put into everybody's portfolio so that uh, you, as, as it's been you know, stated, it's, everybody's always struggling to find the time for what they need to do. And uh, we don't want people just to think this is that emergency management is a sidebar. It's it's unfor it's fortunate and unfortunate. It's it's fortunate that we don't have a lot of emergencies. I know we've been in this pandemic for a while, but in general, we get you know the ice storms. We get the few things, and um, but it's very difficult when you uh, when it's not very often to keep everybody in that realm of preparedness. And I think that's the idea of the recommendation is we really need to come up with a formula to keep everybody prepared. So the few times it does happen, we are very successful and uh, come through it well and get the town back to normal. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, that's all my questions, Chair. Um, yeah, thank you. We've got a lot of work to do on this and uh, I wanna thank um, the consultant and, and all of the fire staff for bringing this forward and we got to do better here. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, are there any other questions? Yes, uh, Regional Councillor Dice. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, most of, of course, my questions have been answered, but it's been a really healthy discussion, and I think we're all a bit concerned about the cost. But I had a couple of questions to the, I guess, for the chief going back. I remember there was quite a, a vigorous conversation about um, the amalgamation of fire service services across the region. And I know Mr. Baker kind of spoke to that because there's efficiencies with the sharing of costs, of course. And um, it also means better locations for fire halls around the region. So it's not just municipality planning them. Um, is that still ongoing? I know it kind of came to an abrupt end, but I had the feeling that 
that kind of vision sort of is is behind some of the issues of not moving forward. Okay, I, I can start on this and uh, CEO Baker may also want to wade into it from a municipality type perspective and, and from talking to the other CEOs and directors in, in the region. Uh, so the short answer is that um, the, the amalgamation of fire services within Durham region during my career has come up about four or five times. Um, to my knowledge, uh, every time it's come forward, it's gone out to the municipalities and Ajax has wrote a, a dissent saying they don't agree with amalgamating the fire service. Um, those were based on previous chiefs and so on. So therefore, um, that's, the, that's what's happened. That's what happened throughout the region. There wasn't enough municipal support from the, the, the various municipalities within the region to move it forward. Uh, so that's, that's where I see that where we've come from and where we are. So I would say at this point, it hasn't been, I don't believe it's been brought up le re uh, recently um, and discussed. Um, moving forward, I think uh, if, if it's something that we think is a good idea, then I believe the appropriate way would be to have a consultation done, get a report back, you know, possibly even like a regional way, uh, have the report come back and then councillors from all the municipalities can look at the pros and cons and make those decisions. Thank you for that. And um, I, I think we've been very protective of our fire services here in Ajax because we appreciate what you do and you're very good at it, I have to say. Um, the public is, is always very pleased with your service. So to let you go to a more regional kind of um, structure is difficult. However, I think one of the main problems is the growth of you as you've identified and specifically with uh, the high rises and you know the, the equipment that entails and the number of men that entails for fires because we don't want to put anybody at risk. I also, wanted to ask a question though about um, paramedics and how they enter into this because um, your medical responses are the highest. I think it was 59% if I remember. Um, and you're always on the scene first. I have to say you're always there. It's great relief to see you. Um, but there, again, I know the province was working on trying to relieve their paramedics by not having to spend as much time in the emergency with their patients. So do, how does that factor into the workload for Ajax when they, res, they have responding to these medical alert calls and has it improved with the provincial changes for paramedics? Okay, I'll, I'll attempt to answer that question. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I don't have all the statistical data to answer the question completely. Um, we, we do always, we always ask for the information, we seldom get it. Uh, um, so, but um, what, what I can say though is uh, just an, in general, um, I would say a good portion, maybe 30% of our calls um, for the paramedicine side, emergency medical service, um, are because the paramedics are short. They, they've only got so many vehicles in the region. And as you said, there's different reasons they could be short on vehicles, an abundance of calls, stuck in the hospitals, waiting patient transfer, things like that. Um, so we do respond when they're not available. So that's, that's kind of part and parcel within our response agreement. Uh, of course, we also respond to anybody who's unconscious, difficulty breathing, things like that. So uh, what they're trying to do is come up and, and better the system at all times to say, what's the best use of the resources between firefighters, paramedics, police, and so on. And the best use of those resources um, does tend to change over the years uh, with, with the data that comes from the medical field, which is with, through the hospitals and so on. Um, as I, I do know uh, through the, um, from the paramedic service in the Durham region, they're constantly working on better ways to free up their staff uh, because they are the professionals and we want them on these scenes as quick as possible for the public's sake. Uh, so as I said, I, I don't have all the answer to your question. 
hopefully that was enough. It, it was certainly, it's a, it's an ever flowing system. It will continue to do that. And um, as I said, and, and we'll continue to be part of um, working with the paramedic service in Durham region and, uh, you know, and, the, and having the firefighters used at the best advantage so that the public receives the ultimate care we can. So is that any different from the mutual aid agreements that we have if we're agreeing to help paramedics with medical calls? Or is that just something we've always done? No, we have, a, it's, a, it's not part of the, the mutual, mutual aid agreement under the FPPA, yeah. which is the Fire Protection and Prevention Act is for other fire services. Right. We do have an agreement with the uh, through the base hospital and through the through the paramedic services. Uh, we work together. There's a joint system, and we have an agreement with the Durham Region Paramedic Service to uh, to actually supply. Um, they they when they call us, you know, all the different details of of the types of calls and so on, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, and they will call us when needed, or like I said, if there's short staff or any of those things. Um, so therefore, uh, it's in a separate agreement that is part of our uh, establishing regulating bylaw that we make that agreement with them to run the service. And uh, I think you'll remember about a year ago, um, we brought a change to council saying we wanted to change that agreement a, bit, a little bit. And what the idea was, it, uh, it was to cut down on the potential exposures because we didn't want firefighters becoming overexposed to COVID-19 patients, being off uh, and not having enough firefighters to fight fires, which is our primary service. So therefore we, we took an abundance of caution, made some changes, uh, but still made sure that we're running the, uh, those dire emergencies to, to ensure that we can uh, assist the public. Thank you, Chief. That, that was very helpful. Those are all my questions, Mr. Chair. You are very welcome. Now, do we have any more questions regarding specifically to the May 2021 Ajax Fire and Emergency Services Fire Master Plan? I'll move the recommendations, and, Chair. Yes, so I guess that means no more questions. All right, so the mayor will be moving the recommendations in this report. Um, all those in favor? Uh, wait, I, uh, sorry, I have, a, I'm sorry, uh, Chair, can I just ask, when you say you move the recommendations, um, what is, what does that mean? Are we slowing this down or what is the, I get the recommendations, but um, okay, got it. Got it. Never mind. Never mind. I, my brain was going a thousand miles a minute the other way. So sorry about that. I apologize. Does that mean you're the one not in favor of the mayor moving this recommendation? <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. I have to well, get my pressure down. Sorry. All those in favor? I see all hands. Any opposed? None. So this carries. And finally, I'd like to move her to adjourn this meeting. I see Regional Councillor Lee. All those in favor? All in favor, none opposed. Sorry.